And good evening, everyone. My name is Franklin, one of the two co-founders of the Northern California Spinal Cord Injury Foundation, also better known as NorCal SCI. Welcome to tonight's presentation on the thoracic rotation, the importance of trunk rotation post SCI. Um, as usual, these presentations are made possible thanks to the generosity of our donors, so we are grateful to them. Uh, we're always happy to have uh, individuals like uh, Rage Khan uh, devoting her time to, to the betterment of our community. So i um, glad that uh, our support continues on with our donors. As usual, we have uh, muted everybody and that way we can uh, avoid any background distractions, noises. Uh, you do have the opportunity of asking Rach questions uh, at the end of her presentation. So uh, simply use the chat field uh, on your Zoom screen to pose any questions and I'll ask them uh, during the Q&A session. And then uh, finally, uh, we are recording this session as we do with all of our sessions. And that way, if you need to jump off uh, the call at any time tonight or uh, those people that were unable to join us, uh, we'll be sending the link to the recorded session first thing tomorrow morning, it'll be in your inbox. So no worries about missing out on anything. Uh, so without further ado, let me gonna jump in and uh, quickly introduce Rach, who is a nationally certified Pilates teacher a certified strength and conditioning specialist and a movement teacher specializing in working with people with neurological deficits, especially spinal cord injuries, and was uh, also just recently certified and licensed as a massage therapist. Um, very honored to have Rach back again. Uh, she's been a longtime supporter of our organization with all these types of uh, presentations that are really always specific to spinal cord injury. So welcome back again, Rach, take it away. All right, awesome. Thanks, Franklin. Uh, and as always, thanks for hosting these. I love the educational component of these workshops. I'm usually teaching classes and working one on one with clients. So this is always a treat. All right, give me a moment here. I'm just going to share my screen with you. second to load here. Great. Okay, you're good. Great, cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, alrighty. So today's topic, uh, it might seem like a simple one. Um, doing a whole workshop on rotation might seem kind of confusing. What's the point of this? Um, but we're going to get into all of this. So let's come right in. Okay, so um, what is thoracic rotation? So our spine is split into three different areas. We've got cervical, thoracic, lumbar, which is the low back area. And then that moves into the sacrum, which is um, that triangle shaped bone you see in that photo, which then goes into the coccyx or the tailbone. So when we're talking about specifically thoracic rotation, we're talking about rotation of basically your rib cage. So it's gonna be your thoracic vertebra. We've got 12 bones, 12 vertebra in that area. Um, and we're primarily talking about the rotation in those 12 vertebra. The reason that we're, um, just gonna click through this here. So, oh, sorry, okay. To make sure I don't miss anything. Um, the reason we're specifically talking about rotation of the thorax is because the way that the ribs and the vertebra in that part of your spine articulate with each other, um, the way that those it's bone on bone um, rotation in that area. And I'm gonna show you, we're gonna pop over to the anatomy app that I've used with you before that three dimensional one. So you'll have a, a better idea of what I'm talking about here, but the way that the vertebra stack on top of each other in your thorax, is basically designed for rotation, as opposed to the bones of your lumbar vertebra being your low back, everything below your rib cage, which is the way that the bones stack on top of each other in your lumbar region is really meant more for flexion and extension, meaning rounding the low back and lifting kind of this tuck and this lift. Whereas the center part of our spine is really built more for rotation. 
the cervical part of our spine being the neck, which I won't really get into today, um, is super mobile and it can really do anything. It can do flexion extension and it's got a really good amount of rotation. Um, I've got another workshop on the neck you can check out if you're interested in that. But for right now, we're just gonna, just gonna focus on the thorax. Um, and then also as a disclaimer here, so for folks today that have um, hardware anywhere, specifically hardware, anywhere near thoracic vertebra. We just want to be extra cautious here. Um, we're talking about rotation. And although it is still fine for folks with hardware to rotate, uh, hardware in the thorax area to rotate, we want to minimize that because what happens with the hardware, and this goes for hardware anywhere in your spine, whether it's in your lumbar, your thoracic, or your cervical vertebra. But what happened? So say you're fused. Um, I used to work with a client that was fused from, I believe it was T2 to T9. So he had seven vertebra um, that, were, that were fused together. So what happens with that? If I asked him to do a rotation in the center of his spine, he would be putting all of that rotation would go to T1, maybe a little bit of T2, the, like the top part of T2. And then it would go to the bottom part, T, uh, what is it, uh, T9 to T12. So instead of having this nice rotation through all 12 of those vertebra, he's only getting it in four to five vertebra, which just means that if he does a forceful rotation, so maybe he's doing a med ball throw. Um, there was another client that I heard of um, at another place where a trainer was twisting with him and was helping him twist. He was also fused through most of his thoracic vertebra. They went a little too far and he had some problems with his hardware after that. So what happens when, you, when we ask folks like that to come into a thoracic rotation, all of that rotational force is dumped into the vertebra above the fusion and the vertebra below the fusion. Okay, so again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it means that we need to minimize that rotation. We don't wanna be doing anything forced or weighted um, again, whether it's cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. So you're just feeling into it. If you've got a fusion or hardware, again, this really goes for anywhere throughout the spine and you're doing a rotation or some kind of a movement anywhere through the spine, you don't ever want to force it um, because that means that we're putting extra stress on those vertebra and it can cause problems later down the line. So for folks that are um, listening today that have a hardware or fusion, just be mindful of that. Stop when your body tells you to stop. Don't, don't push past it. Okay. And a simpler way to think of that instead of the thorax, like, okay, where is this happening? I just want you to think of getting this rotation from your rib cage. Okay. So, you know, you've got ribs up here and you can feel this. You've got ribs down the side. Maybe go ahead and just take your hands and feel the bottom of your rib cage. So those are your, your floating ribs. Um, that's about where your rib cage ends. And it, it goes a little bit past that because of the shape of the ribs. And I'll show you that in a moment. Okay, so anything, I'm just gonna point this camera down, anything in that region where you're palpating right now, from the bottom of the ribs all the way up to about a little above the clap, a little above your um, collarbones, okay? That is your thorax. That is where your thoracic vertebra one through 12 lie. And so that's where we want you to get your rotation from. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing this. I'm gonna pop over to this anatomy app. So give me a sec to open this up. Okay, so going to zoom out a little bit. Okay, so we've got a nice shot of all of the vertebra there. Before I zoom in, I just want you to look at, and I'm not going to really go into the anatomy, but I just want to explain this again, especially for um, my visual learners out there. I want you to look at the vertebra in this area. So this is your thorax, and these are all of your thoracic vertebra. And just look at the shape of these bones here compared to the shape of your lumbar vertebra, 
these five bones down here. Okay, so notice that the lumbar vertebra are wider, thicker, heavier, they're bigger in all of the ways. And then remember, we have this nice S shape of the spine. So this curve here of your low back is built for flexion and extension, bending forward and extending back. If we zoom in now, let's see. Okay, if we zoom in now on these vertebrae, so we're back to the thorax, just look at the way, so I'm just gonna kind of circle with my arrow, the way that these vertebra connect with each other. It's smooth and you can tell if these vertebra wanted to rotate in this area here and this area here and so on, they have room to rotate around each other. I'm gonna zoom out. We're gonna go into the lumbar, the low back. Now notice how this is different here. So these are called your facet joints. It's how the vertebra stack on top of each other on the top and on the bottom. So notice how this is a little different. If these two vertebra wanted to rotate, do you see how um, it, it, it's a little bit harder for it to do that because the we call those the feet of the vertebra, this right here is sticking out more. Again, compared to this, where it's got a little bit of a smoother connection and it can allow for rotation, okay? So it, we can get a little bit of rotation in your lumbar. Some people hear this and they freak out like, oh my gosh, I can't be rotating from my low back. You can get some rotation from the low back and it's important to get a little bit in there, but the majority of your rotation is gonna be coming from your thorax. Okay, I'm gonna bring you back to the PowerPoint. Oh, let me exit out of this first. Okay. Swing you all so I can see you still. <laughs> Managing all of the screens here. Okay, great. So, okay. So why is thoracic rotation important? I can't tell you how many studies there are out there that talk about how thoracic rotation decreases back pain. And I don't work with one client who doesn't have back pain. All of my clients have back pain in some way, shape or form. Um, in fact, I just was reading a study today that was looking at golfers and low back pain and all of that. And all of the low, ba all of the low back pain programs that I've ever seen and that I've ever created for people all have a component of rotation. And especially when you're in a seated position for most of the day, um, in a wheelchair, working, driving, whatever it is that you're doing. Okay, this is also important because when we talk about overall, the importance of overall spinal mobility, you've heard me talk about this in other workshops where um, when we've been designing these home programs, upper body home programs, and all of those past workshops, I'm always talking about how important it is to move your spine and your joints, shoulders, elbows, hips, whatever, in all of the directions possible that those joints can go. This can look like doing a full range of motion. I know a lot of folks out there, um, whether you're doing it yourselves or you're having a caretaker or an assistant do a full range of motion with your lower body or your upper body or whatever it might be, that's no different for your spinal mobility. Okay, so the spine moves in several directions. It moves forward back, so that's flexion extension. It moves in lateral flexion, which is a side bend, side to side. It moves in a translation, let me lower this down, where the ribs are gliding kind of like a staircase over the pelvis. And lastly, it moves in rotation, which is what we're talking about today. Getting all how many, four, or I guess eight times it by two, all eight of those movements into your everyday routine is really important because that kind of 
movement along your vertebra um, helps lubricate the joints. So you saw in that photo and in that app I just showed you how many joints, and I don't have the exact number memorized in my head, but there are dozens and dozens of joints just in your spine alone. Because each one of those vertebra has two at the top, two at the bottom, and then it articulates with the ribs and so on. If we don't move any of those areas, if we're not rotating, if we're not side bending, we're not lubricating those joints, those vertebra, and everything that runs through those vertebra, being nerves, veins, um, the lymph system, arteries, et cetera. So getting a full spinal mobility routine, range of motion in is also really important. You know, the phrase motion is lotion. I think you've heard me say that here before too. That also applies to the spine. And you can't be, you can't have a healthy spinal routine if you're not incorporating rotation into that. It's a big, big component of just keeping your overall spinal health, um, up, up keeping that spinal health. Okay, organ health. This is a big one. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mainly be talking about the kidneys when it comes to rotation, because the kidneys are um, the organ that's the most affected by rotation. But in general, and I've talked about this um, in my mindful movement workshop at the very beginning, but I talked about how doing breath work was basically a way of massaging. So I'm using my hand. Imagine this is my diaphragm. Okay, we, I was talking about using your diaphragm with your inhale and with your exhale to give your organs a massage. With each breath, they move about one to two centimeters with each breath. And that really adds up over the day. So if you're not belly breathing, or if you're not breathing into your ribs, and I'm about to get into this, but if you're not getting into some kind of rotation, we're not massaging the organs, whether it be with our breath or with spinal movements like rotation. So, uh, and then specifically the kidneys move the amount that they move. So the kidneys um, are a little bit, little bit smaller than our fists. They're kind of shaped like beans. I'm gonna pop over to the app and show you that in a moment here. But the kidneys alone with each breath you take move about one to two vertebra. Um, that's maybe like one to three inches or so. So with each breath, and I'm gonna, we're gonna do the movements of the kidneys together, but those kidneys are moving. You add in rotation, and then it becomes basically like a ringing out of some of the organs in there, a ringing out of the kidneys. You're using breath work with it, and then we're returning back to a facing forward position. I'm gonna talk you through all of that. And of course, we'll do some exercises at the end here. But just to say that our organs in general are like the other parts of our body. They need movement. Motion is lotion. We can do that with breath work and we can definitely do that with rotation. If we're not getting rotation and or we're not doing some of that nice diaphragmatic belly breaths, those organs start to stick together. So um, last work workshop, I talked a little bit about fascia being the connective tissue system through your body when I was speaking to the myofascial meridians. We also have a lot of connective tissue within our whole organ, our whole belly area that wraps around the organs, suspends the organs, holds them in place, and then attaches them to the walls of our abdominal cavity and to the fronts, to the backs and to the sides. And the kidneys are actually our only organ that isn't connected through a ligament to our trunk. It's held up by, um, by fascia and by fat. So again, just to say even more important that we use movement to make sure that the kidney is maintaining its healthy range of motion. All of our organs have a certain rhythm to them. And I'm gonna show you the rhythm of the kidneys and we're gonna do an exercise with that. Um, 
again, so if we're not getting especially rotation in and we're not using breath work, that kidney can get really stuck, which can irritate it, which can cause a lot of problems. To pull in some of the Eastern medicine world um, from body work and massage and all of that, your kidneys are your energy source. So if we have irritated and inflamed kidneys, you're gonna find that you're fatigued, that you're tired, um, you don't wanna do anything, unmo unmotivated, all of that. Okay, so the kidneys also hold, they're like the energy stores of the body. Um, let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. So let's gonna show you, let's do this exercise. We'll just do this exercise together right now. I'm gonna back up a little bit. Okay, so in, in a seated position there, I just want you to find your belly button. And you're gonna take your fists and you're gonna bring your fists on either side of the belly button. And you're gonna bring them just maybe an inch or two away from each other and then just lift them up maybe half of an inch or so. You're gonna take your left hand and you're gonna bring it a little bit higher than the right hand. Your left hand, sit, your left kidney sits hot, just slightly higher than your right kidney because we've got our liver on the right side. Okay, so when we take an inhale, remember when we take an inhale, the diaphragm moves down. So when we take an inhale, our kidneys move down, out, and they externally rotate. When we exhale and the diaphragm moves up, remember, imagine that jellyfish, the diaphragm is pumping like this. When we exhale, the kidneys move back, they internally rotate, they move back in towards each other and they drift back up. So I want you to do this movement with your hands and just, just kind of sliding on the outside of your belly. Don't press into your belly yet. We're gonna do that later on. Okay, so I want you to find, breathing just through your nose, I want you to find your belly breath. Okay, remember the belly breath is where we avoid breathing into the chest and we're just breathing into the low belly. As you inhale, move your hands down, away, and externally ro rotate them kind of away from each other. When you exhale, we're going to reverse that. Bring them back in and back up. Inhale, they move down, out, and away. Exhale, they move together, in and up. And I just want you to stay with that movement. I want you to visualize the kidneys moving like this. This is going to be important later because we're going to bring this into a little bit of self-massage and we're gonna test and retest your rotation after we do this. But I just wanna give you this visual of how the kidneys are moving. You inhale, they move down, out and away with that big belly breath. And then exhale, they move in together and up. Okay, scoot back in here. All right, make sure I don't miss anything there. Okay, great. So what are, what are other benefits of thoracic rotation? So we have superficial muscles, and I'll show you some photos of these in a moment. We have superficial muscles and we have deep muscles that help with our thoracic rotation, really help with our full body rotation. When we're working on thoracic rotation, we're strengthening the superficial and the deep muscles. And some of these deep muscles are just muscles that just sit between the ribs. They're called your intercostal muscles. Those also help with your breath. They help you take a really nice full lateral rib breathing, which I haven't talked about much, but it's basically just having the capacity using those deep muscles in between your ribs to take a big lateral rib breath. You use that kind of breath more when um, like you're doing more cardio work, maybe you're, you're punching your arms or you're doing a really active upper body exercise. 
uh, and you're taking bigger breaths, you're using your lateral rib breathing muscles being those deeper muscles that I just was referring to. Okay, this is, um, again, as I said, as we kind of come to the end of this workshop series this month and next month, I'm really trying to pull all of my workshops together, weaving this thread so that you can see how all of this work is so intricately intertwined with each other. Okay, so a workshop I taught, I'm not going to super go into this, but a workshop I taught, I don't know, maybe four or five months ago, um, the, the bed and floor base movement workshop, I talked about working through the motor development stages of a baby and something called the Bartini fundamentals. Okay, not super important, but I just wanna make that link for those of you that have been coming to all of these workshops where whenever we're doing anything using our cross lateral system, meaning I'm rotating my upper, I'm rotating towards my opposite limb. So say one hand might be touching one leg and then I'm touching the opposite leg, okay? So whether I'm doing, that kind of rotation that can look like crawling, it can look like walking, um, it can look like doing that seated rotation. Some even work on a side lie position. Whenever we're doing that, we're tapping into our cross lateral system, which is really important. Like I just mentioned for those gait patterns, whether you're in a seated position, you're crawling or for standing athletes, if you're able to walk. Okay, and then lastly, the workshop that I taught last month on myofascial meridians, the two lines we're tapping into there are your spiral line. Remember, that's the X that you have in the front of your body going from armpit to opposite hip. And then it's the functional lines is the X you have in the back of your body going from armpit to opposite glute, armpit to opposite glute. And I'll show you a photo of that also. Okay, but again, just to bring all of that together, that this visual, and let me click to the next one. Okay, so for example, that visual, that spiral line, when I'm doing rotation, I sometimes like to imagine I've got a sash on. So I'm trying to connect my armpit to that opposite hip. Sometimes I'm coming into flexion if I'm doing more of a bicycle movement. Sometimes I'm, I'm staying seated tall. But whatever it is, when you have a visual like this, okay, this is the myofascial meridian. This is the line of muscles and fascia that I'm using to do this movement. Okay, so for this, for this example, we're using the spiral line in the front of our bodies and we're using the functional line. There's a few functional lines, but look at the... Um, in the functional line picture, the top upper left-hand photo, where you see the back side of that skeleton, that's the X in the back of your body, moving from your lats down to that opposite glute muscle. And again, these are, these are pattern lines of muscles and fascia um, that help us do more functional movement, meaning we're not necessarily just stabilizing, or we're not just flexing, we're doing something really dynamic, such as a rotation. Okay, I'm just gonna pop one more time over to this anatomy app so you can see where the kidneys are before we move on. Okay, so. Okay, so looking from the back side, oh, is this gonna let me zoom in? Looking from the back side of the body. So, okay, you've got your kidneys right here. These are your bean shaped organs right here. Notice that they sit right at the part of your back where your ribs, the very bottom of your ribs, start to meet your low back. This is such an important area of our body. I could do a whole workshop just on this junction here. This is called your thoracolumbar. Um, thoracolumbar fascia, which sits over it, but it's the junction of everything. So right now what you're touching is kind of that superficial, it's this big sheath of fascia, but deep to that are your kidneys here. So on the front side, when you were doing that 
Uh, we're looking at a, at, a, at a female skeleton, by the way. So these are the breasts. Um, so when we were doing that motion with your hands and your fists and we were breathing, this is where you were. We were just a little bit above the belly button and we were doing that movement with the hands. Okay, just wanted to give you that visual there. Let me swoop one more time back to the PowerPoint. Okay, make sure I can see you all. Okay, so how do we do this rotation and some rotation reminders? Okay, so know your limits. This goes mainly for the folks um, that have hardware or fusions in that thoracic region. But this also goes for folks where maybe you maybe you're that all or none kind of person. And whenever you're doing anything, you want to do it the hardest and the fastest and all of that. I have a client like that. This is why I mentioned that. OK, so you want to ease into something like this, especially if this movement is new to you. Don't force anything. Listen to your body. And then just one more thing. The exercises we're just going to do. Uh, really two main exercises today. I might show you a third. These are really simple. You've seen me do these before. We're just bringing the focus to the rotation component. Okay, so for the purpose of the two exercises I'm showing, we want to stay stacked for them. That's not to say that you can't do a kind of rotational movement where you're coming more into flexion. So for example, if I'm doing more of a bicycle movement, whether I'm on the floor or I'm seated and I'm rotating down towards that opposite hip, that's awesome. That's just doing rotation from a flex position, um, but it's just not what we're gonna focus on for the purpose of today's workshop. So for the purpose of this kind of rotation I'm gonna teach you, I want you to stay stacked. I want you to imagine like if you had a beam coming out the crown of your head. Okay, so it's your center axis going all the way down through your spine. We're trying to rotate. I almost think of, oh, what is that? Um, I, like I'm imagining a bell ballerina on one of those, like a toy ballerina on one of those poles and it just perfectly spins around like a music box. I like to, I like to think about that. So you're just trying to rotate around that center axis. We're not shifting, we're not flexing, we're just rotating. Okay, the one thing I always, always see with my clients, especially when they first start to do this, is it, they translate away from their rotation. Okay, so if I'm rotating in this direction and I'm, I'm gonna do it uh, cheating, so notice as I rotate, I kind of let my, my ribs shift to the side. Okay, so I'm adding a little bit of a rib translation as I'm rotating, okay? That's cheating. We don't wanna do that. It's easier, it will feel easier. We'll feel like you're going farther and you can try this right now. It'll feel like you're going farther because you're adding a lean into it. Again, we really wanna stay stacked keeping those vertebra stacked one on top of the other. And we wanna rotate around our center axes. So uh, when I say don't shift away, that's what, that's what I mean by that. Bring the eyes with you. Uh, for those of you that took my, my visual workshop on the eyes and the visual system, um, gosh, this was maybe a year ago at this point. I, I go extensively into how the eyes can really influence our movement. But the biggest movement I see our eyes influence is rotation. It's my go-to. If somebody is getting some sticky rotation, meaning maybe they're not rotating as fully as I want them to, I'm interested in the kidneys. I'm interested in their visual system. So just to say here, I'm not gonna super go into the visual system right now, but just to say that when you're doing this rotation, instead of just looking where the head and the neck are, what is the furthest thing behind you that you can see? 
right now I can see that doorknob behind me. Okay. So I want you to think of, it should feel like you're straining your eyes. Like, wow, this is not very comfortable for my eyes. What is the furthest thing that I can see? Okay, and then always doing a check recheck. I say this more when you start to, when you start this kind of a movement. Everyone does rotation in their day-to-day life, but when we're doing this really intentional kind of rotation, it's always good to do a check and a recheck before. We're gonna do a little bit of breath work. We're gonna incorporate the eyes. And does your rotation get better? Does it get worse? If it gets worse, that's really good information for you to know because it means your nervous system had what we call a startle. It was startled in some way, maybe we overloaded the nervous system. So doing this check recheck, which is what I'm gonna talk you all through now, is just a good way to know, is whatever I'm trying to do, rotation for this matter, is my rotation getting better after we do a couple of these exercises and movements, um, using the eyes, doing breath work and all of that. Is that it? Okay, let me, let me rewind. Okay, good. Okay, so let's do this. Let's come back to the kidneys. Oh, wait, hang on. I almost forgot. Let's do our check and our recheck. So as our test, I'm just going to have you take, hold your hands up, make a fist. So elbows are bent. This is going to be your test. I know some of you, because I can see you on video here. I know some of you have been playing with rotation, but this is just going to be your test. Um, you want, might want to make sure you're it not in a, and I can't tell with some of you, but that you're not in a spinny chair. And if you are in a spinny chair, just to make sure that your, your lower body is staying steady. Okay, so we're just gonna take, we're gonna rotate to the left. You can bring your eyes with you. Don't force anything. Notice how far you're getting. And then go ahead and switch, rotate to the right. Move slow. Is it harder to rotate in one direction than the other? Is it harder to breathe when you are in that rotated position? Or perhaps it's harder to breathe on one, in one direction? Okay, so you're just noticing. Okay, so that's your test retest. You know, you have a good mark, like, okay, I can turn and I can see the books behind me. Okay, so that when we come back to that, you've got a good, a good idea of where you are right now. We're going to come back to some of that kidney work. So now we're going to bring it a little bit more into massage. So we're going to try to put, you can do this with your hands in the front of your body or with your hands in your back. Your hands in your back, it's going to be a little bit closer to your kidneys, but I actually find that just for the ease of me showing you, but also being able to sink your hands into that viscera, into your organs, um, can make a really big difference. So maybe start with your hands here, but if you're not noticing a difference, know that you can always do the, this exact sequence with your hands in the back of your body. We're gonna do exactly what we did before, where we're breathing with the hands and our hands are emulating our kidneys except we're gonna to start to put pressure on our stomach. So we're, we're just adding a little bit of organ massage. Okay, with the big caveat of don't overdo this here. We're not, we're not trying to mash the organs. We're not trying to squish them. If you, have an assi if you have someone assisting you doing this, they don't need to be pressing super hard. Just press into the belly. And when you feel the belly press back, you've gone far enough. Okay, so I'm just going to give you, actually, maybe I'll stay, I'll stay facing you so you can see that. So we're just going to come into this again. Okay, so find your belly button, make a fist, slide the fist a couple inches away from each other and just a little bit up. Make sure that left hand is higher than your right hand. Okay, now press your hands into your belly. Okay, just find a good amount of pressure there. We're going to take an inhale the hands slide down and away. I'm still keeping that pressure into my belly. And then as I exhale, I massage my belly and I slide the hands back up. Inhale, I massage and slide the hands down. Exhale, 
in, together, and up. Stay with that for a few more breaths. Inhale away and down. Exhale together and up. Inhale away and down. Exhale together and up. Keep going with that. Remember, this is supposed to be a low belly breath. So if you have the ability to make that a diaphragmatic breath where you're not breathing into the chest, but you're breathing into the low belly, that's where I want you to stay. And your hands are just moving at the pace of your breath here. Inhale down and away. Exhale together up. Let's do one more. Inhale down and away. Exhale together and up. Okay, good. Relax. Go ahead and shake the hands out. We're going to find a recheck. In fact, I'm going to expand you all. So I want to be able to see, hang on one sec. Okay, that's, that's good for now. Okay, so let's do this. Find, find your recheck position. So make a fist, bend your elbows. Find that same rotation. Rotating to the left, rotating to the right. And just notice if anything changed for you. Can you go further? Is it easier to breathe? Did this get harder for you? Okay. And just out of curiosity, because we've got a few folks today that have, oops, Zoom. Okay, we have a few folks today that have your videos on, which is great. Just out of curiosity, give me a thumbs up if your rotation improved, a side thumb if it stayed the same, and a down thumb if it got worse. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I see you. Yeah, awesome. Wow. I think that's all thumbs up for those who have their videos on. Great. How easy is that? <laughs> okay. It doesn't take a lot to improve the rotation of our spine, to improve our organ health, to bring some intention to our breath, and to make things a little bit more mobile in there. We maybe did, we maybe did eight breaths, and we did a little bit of self-massage. It doesn't take much. Okay, so let's bring the eyes into this now. And I just want to say that what we just did with the hands is something that you can do as you rotate. Okay, so if you wanted to bring that into your rotation, you could do the same hand movements, maybe an, in, an inhale to rotate and exhale to center. Inhale to rotate, exhale to center. And you can be using the same hand movements. Okay, just to keep this simple though, we're gonna do a couple of things uh, with the eyes though. Okay, so we're gonna bring that focus to the eyes. So I just want you to find a rotation. You can have the hands in that same position. And I want you to focus your eyes on the furthest thing possible. What is the furthest thing possible that you can see behind you? Hold your eyes there for five seconds. Come back to the center. Rotate the other way, same thing. What is the furthest thing behind you? I want you to strain your eyes. This should feel uncomfortable for your eyes. Hold it for five seconds. Come back to the center and pause. I'm just gonna give you all a friendly reminder. I see some of you doing this, um, avoiding the rotation <laughs> as you rotate. Okay, so again, I want you to rotate around that center axis. Just do a check-in with yourself like, you can even look at yourself in the camera if you're able to see yourself. Am I aligned? Now bring your eyes with you. There we go. That looks better. Yeah, yeah, that looks better for some of you. Yeah. Notice where your head and your neck are. Can we keep that head and neck stacked over the spine? That looks really good. Yeah. And you might even find that with each rotation, as you bring your eyes with you, you can see a little bit further. You rotate a little bit more. Instead of seeing the door handle, I can now see the artwork behind me, okay? Even if your eyes were able to move a centimeter, an inch, a foot, whatever it is, just 
pushing your eyes to their furthest range of motion can help improve your thoracic rotation. One of the big things I talk about in that visual workshop is your body is not going to move where your eyes can't go. In other words, if we have muscles that control our eyes, if those muscles haven't been worked in a while and I haven't looked really far to my right, then I'm probably, my thorax is probably not gonna rotate very well to my right. So the idea is that now we're challenging our eye range of motion, which most of the time translates to an improvement in our thoracic rotation in that same direction as well. Okay, so let's just do one more test. For those of you that found you were able to rotate more when you brought your eyes with you, give me a thumbs up, side thumbs if it stayed the same and down thumb if it got worse. Yeah, and I'm saying all thumbs up again. Awesome, that's great, that's really good. Okay, so that is really easy seated thoracic rotation. Again, we're staying in an upright position. We're not coming into flexion, although you can definitely bring it there if you'd like. So I just want to show you one more way to get um, a really simple way to get thoracic rotation. I'm just going to adjust the camera here from either a bed or a floor space. I'm just gonna stay on the floor. This is a really good method to use if you wake up in the morning, when you go to sleep at night, if you're doing some kind of a, a floor routine. Okay, that's good there. Okay, so of course you might need some assistance getting down onto the floor, but I want you in this side lie um, almost a fetal position here. Knees can be aligned with the hips. You can always put a bolster between the legs if you need some support there. And then you want a pillow under the head so the neck stays in alignment um, with the spine. Okay, hands are gonna be on top, of each, uh, on top of each other. You can always do a shoulder glide here. I'm just gonna throw this in, this doesn't... Um, <laughs> This isn't super important to include, but it's a nice way to just start by getting your shoulder blade moving, gliding that top hand forward and back. So just helping to mobilize the shoulder blade, remember, which is plays into some of your thoracic rotation too, if it's stiff in there. So this can just be a good little warm up. Then I want you to pull that shoulder back. Again, you might need some assistance here, but you're gonna open that arm. You're gonna bring your head, your neck, and your thorax with you. Okay, now right here, not pulling my mic, right here, what I'm trying to do, this isn't, this isn't just a passive stretch, I want this to be active. I'm trying to keep my hips and my low back pointing forward. This is because we're trying to isolate, uh, isolate the rotation in your thorax. Hips and, um, hips and low back stay facing forward. It's just my head, my neck, and my thoracic vertebra that are rotating with me. I'm gonna adjust the pillow a little bit. And I come into this full rotation. I bring my hand behind me, my head, my neck, my eyes go with me. And I'm finding this opposition of opening the ribs back, pulling the hips forward. If sensation and um, engagement and connection in your lower body is challenging for you, don't worry about that as much. We're just trying to get as much openness through this whole area as possible. It's really nice to stop and then turn this into a breathing exercise for your top ribs. I even like to take my bottom hand, place them over my top ribs and take some lateral rib breaths into there because my hand is giving me some feedback. I'm trying to take a breath into my hand. You can do this from a seated position as well. You can take that opposite hand and you can just hold it and make it a breathing exercise. So if you're in a seated position, um, you can 
you can bring this more into some breath work. And then I would close the arm back to the center. A really great addition to this exercise, I'm gonna give myself a thumbs up. You can also hold a pencil, um, something, something specific for your eyes to look at. I'm just gonna use my thumb just for um, purposes of, of time here. And I'm looking at the very bottom, a precise point at the very bottom of my thumbnail. I want that point to be precise because it makes it more challenging for the visual system. So now again, we're just bringing the eyes into this movement. I'm gonna open, I'm gonna rotate, I'm gonna bring that thumb back as far as I can see. And if my eyes can go past that thumb, if I can see something on my mat or something on the floor, I'm gonna try to go a little bit further. Same thing we did from the seated position. I hold for five seconds. I'm challenging my eyes. I'm trying to breathe slow and steady into the top of my ribs. And then I bring that arm all the way back to the center. And then of course you would do the same thing on the other side. So that's something that you can do. You know, I'll usually do it maybe three to four times with people. It's incorporating a lot of things. We're working the visual system. We're working rotation. We can do breath work there. We can do some of that kidney work in there. <clears throat> but I guarantee you, if you come and you do rotation like that, and then you come back to seated rotation and you do your check and your recheck, um, it's, it's gonna be better than when you started. It's nice to do that kind of rotation on the floor because unlike being in a vertical position, you're just a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, you're a little bit more supported. So it really allows you um, to focus more on your form, on your breath and on your eyes than it does when you're in a seated position. You can't really cheat as much when you're uh, in that side lie position. So even if you can do all of this in a seated position, try doing it in a side lie position as well, because it's just a nice change. Cool, I'm gonna, let's see, did I hit everything there? Yeah, great. So just a photo of a bear looking over their shoulder, right? Because rotation at the end of the day is the ability, that functional ability for us to either look behind us, whether we're backing up out of, um, for those of you that drive, if you're backing up out of a parking spot, someone calls your name behind you, you have to reach something behind you. It's a really functional movement that we need, not just for our everyday lives, but it helps maintain our bone health, our spine health, our organ health, um, and everything in between. And I think, so you try to miss anything. I think that is it. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, first one, person is asking about the spinal rotation and spinal bone health. Uh, and she's thinking of more of sort of osteoporosis and women. Uh, do you have any sort of thoughts in that respect? Yeah, um, just in terms of like, is spinal rotation okay if you have osteo osteoporosis? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Um, but I would say this again, listen to your body and don't push anything, but actually the thing with osteopenia and osteoporosis, so I'm going to just have a sip of water. The most recommended movements, the two most recommended movements when you have either osteopenia or osteoporosis is extension of the spine and loaded weight bearing activity. So rotation is great. It's a part of that overall spinal health that I mentioned, but you definitely want to make sure that you're getting spinal extension in. Remember that's any movement going like this. It's really nice if you're able to, to do those movements off of the floor, if you're able to do a chest lift um, or anything like that. And then you want to load your spine. You want weights and you want to do some kind of weighted loaded movement. Um, where your bones are having to respond to that load. So yeah, rotation is fine, but I would emphasize extension and loaded movements also. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, this gentleman is a quadriplegic, very little sensation up and down below his neck. Um, how would he, and he's gonna require assistance with most of the uh, 
routines that you showed, how would he be able to to tell when not to over extend, you know, any kind of rotation when he doesn't have a whole lot of sensation? And yeah. When he's getting assisted by someone, what is a natural or good way for him to progress uh, to to a safe, you know, uh, position? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, before that question, I'm just going to mention one other thing. Um, this rotation, no, this kind of thoracic rotation, no matter your injury, whether you have cervical, thoracic, or a lumbar spinal cord injury, is really, really important, even if you don't have sensation, connection, or strength in the thorax of your body. Because like I said, it this kind of rotation benefits so many things that even if it's passive, which I'm going to get into with this question, even if the movement is passive, you still get all of those benefits. You still are helping with your um, overall spinal mobility. You're lubricating the joints. And remember, we have not just the spinal cord that runs through your vertebra, we have all of your spinal nerves that come out the sides of those vertebra. So if we can keep your vertebra healthy, we can help prevent a lot of other problems with like bone, um, the bone canals narrowing and pinching nerves and deterioration of those bones and all of that. We can help prevent all of that just from doing these movements whether they are active or passive. That goes for organ health and, and all of the breathing exercises too. So, sorry, I just wanted to say that because that, that was a big point that I missed. Um, for, for this person, when you have someone assisting you and you don't have much sensation there, it's, um, you first off, you wanna be in constant communication with the person that's doing these movements with you move really slow. But if that person is listening to your body, the body is going to let that person know when it doesn't, it's going to stop. It's not going to want to rotate anymore. So starting with a small range of motion and um, yeah, I guess it's kind of hard for me. <laughs> I need two people. Um, it's kind of hard for me to show this, but say someone is lying like this, I would be behind them, stabilizing their hips. And I would just gently grab their arm and their shoulder, supporting their spine. And I would just slowly open and rotate. And first you might just let gravity do the work for you, but you're feeling for that person assisting, you're feeling when does their, when does their spine not want to rotate anymore? It's a conversation with the person verbally, but it's also a conversation with the physical body in front of you. If you feel like it can't go anymore, don't force it, don't push it. Um, and especially if that person, if you do not have a uh, fusion or hardware in your thoracic vertebra, there's even less to worry about, um, assuming that the vertebra and your thorax are in a, in a healthy condition. Um, but yeah, you want to listen to their body. Don't go too far past and be behind them when you're assisting them on the floor. If you're assisting them from a seated position, again, having something like, um, you know, if I were in a seated position and I were trying to rotate this person, I would be behind them. I would maybe scoop under their armpit and I would have one hand on their back and I would just gently rotate them. Again, not forcing it, I'm just feeling it. When the body tells me to stop, when the body isn't rotating anymore, I pause. I would maybe cue them to bring their eyes as far as they can. I would cue them to breathe as low into their torso as they could. And then we would return back to the center. Okay, excellent tips. All right, uh, next person, um, obviously he probably didn't have his camera on. So he's in a power wheelchair and he is not able to rotate significantly because of the cushion, the, the back, you know, uh, cushion. Yeah. Uh, any sort of ideas or any tips on how to, you know, deal with that? Yeah. Let me, let me just grab something. And I think I'm realizing that I, I left my, um, my foam roller at work. But what you can do with that, if you have a half foam roller, 
you can always stick a half foam roller behind your back. If you don't, okay, I'm doing an awful job at rolling this towel, but you get the idea. M make a nice pretty roll with the towel and with a long towel and you would put it vertically along your spine and it will push you out from the chair just a little bit. <laughs> this is an off the, off, awful example, but you, you get where I'm going with this. And then it will allow you to just get, remember we're not going, the spine isn't, we're not trying to do a total 180 here. We just want a little bit, even a little bit of spinal rotation um, can really go a long way. So take a towel, you can even take some pillows. If you have a half, one of those half foam rollers, those I find are the best because it really gives some good feedback to the spine and it pushes you away from the chair to allow for that rotation. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, when I do the twisting rotation, I get a stinging sore pain even when I did the floor exercise. This is on the lower spine. Okay. Um, is this an indicative of the, the point of injury being perhaps squeezed that causes this kind of pain? Yeah, I would say, well, I would have a couple of questions. If you have hardware, well, regardless of whether you have hardware and infusion or not, we don't want to go into pain. Um, you know, a stretch, a lengthening, a new sensation of, wow, I've never rotated like this before. That's all okay. But when we cross over into that pain category, we've gone a little too far. So I would say, I would first say, maybe don't rotate as far as you go. If you do half of that rotation, does that pain kick in? If not, stay with just that small amount of rotation until your body gets used to it. Um, yeah, it's possible you were going too far or it's possible that, especially if you have a fusion or hardware in the thorax, it's possible that you were dumping that rotation into either your lower thoracic vertebra or into your lumbar vertebra. Remember I said um, rotation in the lumbar vertebra is okay, but it's not its main job and we don't want most of the rotation to go there. This can also actually happen. And I've seen this happen before with quite a few clients where they don't necessarily have a fusion or hardware in the thoracic vertebra, but they're so stiff and locked up the thoracic vertebra that then when they try to rotate it ends up dumping into the low back or the neck a little bit too much um, if you find that's happening to you sometimes it's nice to like put your hands on your waist okay so that's waist is or right about at your belly button which is where the lumbar vertebra is and make sure that when you rotate again if this is happening for you that you're not um, that your, your hands aren't coming with you, especially if you're really stiff through your thorax, because it might mean that that rotation is dumping a little bit too much into the lumbar vertebra. Uh, so yeah, just, just check in with yourself there. Okay, next question. Uh, this person experiences a lot of spasticity. Uh, how do you suggest uh, that he, he fight through that or just to kind of deal with that as part of the rotations? Yeah, I, uh, maybe I should do a, a workshop on dealing with spasticity. Um, yeah, there are definitely methods. And I actually, I'm trying to remember if, if Stephanie touched on this in any of her workshops last year. I don't think she did. Um, I think I just was reading about it. Um, so there are methods that help calm the spasticity, like Coming back to the floor, I think that I talked about this in my floor um, slash bed based movements where getting on the floor and doing some kind of a rocking, bouncing, swaying side to side movement um, is really good for the nervous system to help calm the nervous system. You're being supported by the floor. And sometimes like I used to work with a client who was very, very spastic and we would spend um, say the first 20 to 30 minutes just on the floor doing bouncing rhythmic type movements to help decrease his tone and his spasticity. Um, you can try some of those. 
if you're unable to, or if those don't work, try to start with some of the kidney and the breath work. I mean, we just did one cycle of the breathing today. Maybe try doing that for five minutes. Sit there and make it a five minute almost like a meditation stomach self-massage where you're moving with that and see if that helps with the spasticity. Uh, in terms of fighting through it, um, you know, that's okay. Like you can use, if you find that, you know, again, so let's, for, for example, let's say this person is not fused um, and doesn't have hardware, you know, it's okay. Like using the arms of your chair, it's okay to, it's not cheating. It's fine to grab the arm and help you rotate. If it's hard for you to do on yourself and you're finding that spasms are kicking in, using or grabbing onto something just to find that extra little bit of length is, is fine too. Again, as long as you're not forcing it and you're listening to your body. Okay. And I thought we might get through this workshop without this question being raised, but um, I was wrong. <laughs> the question is, drum roll, how long should I be doing these for ever on any given day? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, you know, this is, these are really easy movements to incorporate into some kind of a, like a warm up routine. You could take five minutes while your toast is in the micro, you know, in the, in the oven, it doesn't take much. So, you know, doing, if you're in a seated position, doing anywhere from, I would say maybe eight to 15 rotations each side or start with the kidney breathing, do one to two cycles of that, do eight to 12 rotations each side and you're on your way. Um, this doesn't need to be something that takes any longer than five minutes. And if you're getting down on the floor, if you're able to get down the floor, you can bring in that side lie. And again, like I said, doing that um, three to five times on each side is usually a good amount. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Yeah, in terms of how many days, I mean, you could do this every, every day of the week. This is a gentle enough movement where you could do it every day a week, but you're probably not going to see a change if you do it less than twice a week. So you can start with two times a week and, and you can increase it from there. Yeah, and especially those people that are kind of working remotely from home, they sit in front of their computer and they lose track of time. This is a great uh, sort of practice to, to get into a couple of times during the, their work day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, take a take a three minute break from your computer. And it's also nice too. I'll say one thing with this, especially with the visual system. It's nice if you're doing these stretches, if you're taking a break from the computer or whatever the work is that you're doing to turn away from the computer, have your eyes looking at something farther than 12 to 14 inches in front of you. Um, a big part of why our society's eyes are not functioning as well as they could is because we're only using them in this short range, this 12 to 14 range. Let your eyes see at a distance, turn away from your computer, do the movements, do some of the eye work, um, and then come back to your work. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Rach, as always. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. As I mentioned, uh, we've been recording the presentation. So uh, we will be sending it in, into your inbox as first thing tomorrow morning. And uh, Rach and I need to cook up our October plan. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to come back to us uh, next month and look for uh, the announcement in our newsletter about uh, what we're going to be doing. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Have a good night and good night to you as well, Rach. Okay, awesome. Thanks, everybody. See you okay. next time. Bye-bye.